Well, we're very excited to welcome you here um, to the fourth annual Bridging the Divide Symposium virtually. Um, I think if nothing else, I've just been so struck by seeing people from all over the globe join us. Um, for both Amy and me and for all of us who are taking the time to come today, we're just very grateful. It's a time of such uncertainty and challenge and having the opportunity to come together to talk about a shared commitment to the human right to mental health and cancer care. It's just really um, a wonderful opportunity and I feel really privileged uh, to join in that discussion with you. And I'm really excited to be here too. Um, I'm thrilled to introduce my colleague and, and mentor and um, partner in crime, Dr. Kelly Irwin, um, who is uh, the director of our program and of the Engage Initiative and, um, you know, will be heading things up today. Um, she has built an incredible program and initiative that um, I believe, and I know many of you uh, here today believe, is going to change the face of healthcare for individuals with a mental illness and cancer. I think we're doing that right now at Mass General. And I think that as this initiative grows, we will continue to see that change within um, our system across the country. So I'm thrilled to be a part of the work that, um, that we share um, at Mass General Hospital. Thank you so much, Amy. Um, of course, this is an incredible team effort um, and it really takes all of us to make real change and to see the photos and images that you have been sending in to feel how much energy there was, um, you know, in the work groups and the lead up. I mean, I, I already read a question in the chat, asked where you're calling in from just because I've been excited to see where everybody is. So I just want to encourage everybody to start participating um, and use the chat function because I think that although we can't be together like in person, we're gonna foster that interaction. That's what is so, so powerful about this time. If you have any questions about that, you can also write those in the chat. And that's really what we see up here. Um, all these faces really bring up um, how our work has grown over the past five years um, and the many different people from our collaborating organizations um, who are so central to that effort from the Department of Mental Health, from the National Alliance on Mental Illness, from Mass General Psychiatry, Cancer Center, Social Work, um, North Suffolk Mental Health, the many people with lived experience and living experience who, who are caregivers who are taking the time to share that. Um, that's what makes us strong. Um, and that's what makes this event special to me. It's that we all, um, you are not just here in a professional role, we're here because this really matters to us. Um, and so it's always really important to me to think about that. I was, as I was looking at this, and thinking about what's going on right now all across the world, that, you know, it had even more salience to think about for me. So I'm, I'm reading a quote from Susan Sontag. Um, Everyone who is born holds dual citizenship in the kingdom of the well and the kingdom of the sick. And although we all prefer to use only the good passport, sooner or later, each of us is obliged to identify ourselves as citizens of that other place. When Susan Sontag was writing, she was originally writing about the experience of cancer um, and how stigmatizing that was when she was first diagnosed. Um, when I usually read this quote, I also am thinking about the experience of mental illness, um, you know, and, I, and how resonant that is for me that none of us is here just as a clinician, that we're all people who are caring for people or who have been personally affected by cancer or mental illness. And in this moment today, we're also having this shared experience of being worried about getting sick or infecting someone else or one of our loved ones. And that in a way, it brings us closer even though we're physically apart.
So later in the day, we're gonna to get to hear from the one and only wounded healer a little more about mental health discrimination. Um, but I wanted to start us off by reflecting a little bit about how educational it is to Google Cancer Center and Google Mental Health Clinic. So for me, you know, a cancer center, when it comes up on the screen, when we think about it, when we talk about it, it's shiny, it's full of glass windows, it's cutting edge, clinical trials. It's so many things I love about working in a cancer center. The brilliant people I get to work with, um, certainly there are sad elements of it, but I also really feel that we're all coming together. Um, and the image that had come up it, you know, if you're calling in, that's totally fine. We welcome calling in. Uh, I just want to just convey what, what, what's coming to mind for me. It's, it's really kind of the feeling of going to a strip mall. Or for me, it's the feeling of in many cities in the United States, I've been to a cancer center and the next door there's been a cement block um, for the mental health system. And it just, you know, makes me angry that there isn't light um, and you know, windows and equitable allocation of resources for mental health and cancer care. Um, it also brings up a lot of the issues and challenges that we are trying to, to get to in this bridging the divide event, which is that there's fragmentation between cancer and mental health care. And that many times people with the experience of mental illness and cancer or their caregivers are the ones who are trying to bridge that divide. And what can we do as clinicians, um, as researchers, as people who care about this, to help bridge that divide, because there are consequences of that divide. And one of the, the most striking ones is that people with serious mental illness, now the statistic is from Massachusetts, but it's actually found almost universally um, in, in countries that have universal health coverage as well. There's at least a 15 to 20 year mortality gap experienced by people with serious mental illness. The data from Massachusetts is that people die 30 years younger who have serious mental illness compared to those who don't. It's a 30 year mortality gap. It's just like an incredible human rights violation. And 80% of that mortality gap is from medical issues. Cancer is the second leading cause of death. And what's really important here is that we can do something about it because much of that mortality gap is due to not receiving equitable care, to not getting screened, to getting diagnosed late, to experiencing disparities in treatment. We know that one half of clinical trials, cancer clinical trials, or for what it's worth, collaborative care trials exclude people with serious mental illness. That doesn't make sense. That's also a human rights violation, and it really impacts quality of life and survival. And that's such an important part of why, together with our collaborators, um, and our stakeholder board, we created this coalition, the Engage Initiative, um, because that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to bring together all of us in this room, the diverse voices that we have to overcome these barriers to cancer care and research and advocacy and close this mortality gap. So who are we? <laughs> um, we're here. I think we're also gonna launch a poll at this time, so please do go ahead and, and answer the poll. One reason we felt it was worthwhile and important is because we really want to know who's here and we want to make sure that what we talk about is relevant for you. We also lack data about the experience right now of what it's like for people affected by mental health and cancer to be coping with the uncertainty and change relevant to COVID-19. So for both those reasons, um, we hope you will take the very brief poll. <laughs> um, so you can go ahead and you can click more than one. I can't do it because I'm a host, but everybody else can. Um, so while you're doing that, um, who's in this room? We have a lot of different kinds of clinicians. Um, I've been struck just even over the past year of how many more nurses have been joining us, though I know that over the past three weeks that they are often on the front, front lines in the hospital but we often have a, a very even split between oncology, primary care, and palliative care clinicians, whether that be physicians or allied, allied health professionals, nurse practitioners, PAs, nurse nursing, and mental health clinicians. 
Our collaboration with social work is of course at the very core of what makes our model work. I certainly can do it, I'm much less important um, than Amy. Um, we also collaborate very closely with our navigator, Priya Brown, who is the other fundamental kind of part of our core clinical team in addition to like our, our trainees and students. We have psychologists in the room, licensed mental health clinicians, frontline mental health staff, administrators, policymakers, uh, heads of foundations, um, and look here at the poll. Caregivers, people with lived experience, um, and I think that will, you know, continue to fill in. But I'm proud of you guys. So we got 93 out of 154. That's pretty good. I'm sure we can kind of get there. But I'm, it's nice to see who's here. So also researchers and students. Um, so it's just it's nice to see that the mix of people in the room um, who I think, you know, are really eager to both discuss this disparity and also think together about how we can come together as a community during this time of, of uncertainty. So, we're now, you know, in terms of when we look at your registration and we look at all the different institutions that are represented, I, I think it's really amazing. I was just looking at my email and I was like saying to my daughter, Peru, Portugal, Ireland, all in the space of an hour. That is one of the wonderful things about being able to do parts of this virtually. Um, and certainly has been a privilege for me. I'm wearing my dress that I've gotten in Vietnam when I was teach it, teaching there in Vietnam with my palliative care colleagues. So I felt like it would be meaningful to think about the last time I was, you know, traveling um, and, and know that we'll be doing that again, but that we're also coming together. But the, the key point here is that there's a lot of different kinds of organizations. Many are mental health organizations that don't have a, a lot of interaction with cancer centers. We also have a lot of wonderful leadership from the elder affairs, from folks who are really being innovative about how to reach older adults, um, people who are, have a lot of expertise in, in particular populations, in culturally tailored interventions, from the government, from certainly from Mass General, and just many of the, of the wonderful organizations that, that we've gotten to collaborate with over the years. So yeah, so in terms of who's here virtually, pretty good span, you know, from, from Canada to South Korea and Peru. And certainly all over the United States. Um, and last week, you know, we certainly had a lot of people calling in from, from different cancer centers, but I, I, I hadn't known anybody in Bozeman, Montana, so I was like pretty excited uh, about that. Um, and I just want to kind of personally just say that if you are, maybe you're a social worker or a nurse who feels like you might be the person who is, is kind of an advocate for this in your, in your area, and Amy and I both very much feel like we would want you to reach out, we want all of us to reach out together if we could be helpful for clinical problem solving or certainly for, for collaboration. So when we talk about a, a profound gap, in cancer mortality um, and access to cancer care. The question becomes, you know, what can we do about that? Um, and our program did a series of studies and learned that early psychiatry care at the time of cancer diagnosis had the potential to prevent disruptions in cancer care. And that was really exciting that we could think about designing an intervention that had the power to save lives from cancer, and we could try to figure that out together. But certainly in the, those days, a lot of people thought that was a really bad idea. Um, <laughs> Dr. Irwin, you will never be able to enroll people with serious mental illness and cancer in a clinical trial. Don't you know that that's like really hard? Um, <laughs> they never, like they won't be able to consent to the trial, it won't be feasible, it'll take you so long, we don't have people with serious mental illness in our cancer center. And I said, okay. Um, and we did it anyway, um, and we were able to develop a tailored intervention that we'll tell you more about that's very much a team-based, person-centered intervention that, as it says up there, it starts with meeting people where they are, with what matters to them, um, and thinking about how we can integrate that into 
uh, a collaborative care intervention. Um, but we were able to enroll rapidly into our trial. We found that it was feasible um, and acceptable and people found it promising and we're currently conducting the first randomized control trial in this population with, with funding from the National Cancer Institute. Um, so we have a, you know, certainly um, changed the intervention and made it even better over the years. We now engage caregivers, we thought a lot about our model, but that core idea of could we get mental health on board at the time of cancer diagnosis and partner with oncology and help people get to like what matters at the end of it with the team, that's really been what has inspired um, the growth of, of this initiative, I think. Um, and I think that, that at the core of it, we've always felt really strongly that we've, we'd be doing these three things, clinical care, research, you know, and advocacy and education, that we really couldn't just do one of those. So we, we were always thinking about, you know, as clinicians first, about what the needs are of the people that we're caring for, who we're missing. I mean, today I'm thinking about who I haven't been able to reach, who I might be worried about in a nursing facility, who's acutely hospitalized today psychiatrically. We're, we're caring for people. But we're also mindful of wanting to do the kind of research that can enable us to, to know whether a proactive psychiatry consultation and social work case management does make it possible to decrease inequities in care and therefore make an argument that it should be standard of care for every person, no matter where they, they get their cancer care. Um, and the strength of partnerships and of your stories and of all these people in this virtual room is that we'd be able to then advocate for a change like that. And this is our stakeholder board, you know, which meets monthly and is a really um, great, for me, it's been a wonderful learning experience um, of how much you can kind of learn and come together um, across kind of roles. For me, it's been actually something I've, I've, I've said a lot to people like from trainees, like I think it's a really good experience to collaborate with people you've cared for who've been your patients. Um, that is just a really important experience. And one of the things I've observed is that I think collaborating with that was probably better than, than the medication in terms of its impact on functioning. Um, and I think that that's a really key thing in terms of what actually works to decrease mental health discrimination. It's actually coming together and doing something that's not related to being a doctor or a patient, something with purpose. Um, but also getting to collaborate with you know, colleagues from radiology and you know, North Suffolk and National Alliance of Mental Illness and my, our wonderful team at Mass General is a privilege, something that we all very much look forward to. So this is our model. So you can see that the person is at the center. Um, and that, you know, we have a line coming off the person with the caregiver. So you folks in the room probably thought about this. People with serious mental illness, they're not usually married, right? I mean, some people are, of course. Um, but in our first trial, only about 20% of, of the people who participated were, were married. And so who were their caregivers? Sometimes they were children or siblings or parents. And sometimes they were frontline uh, community mental health staff. So if you guys are out there, community mental health staff, <laughs> That was a really important realization for us. Priya, you're out there, I know. Um, but I'm sure other folks are too. And, and Amy and, just, and I were like, how do we support someone who really has become the advocate for a person with serious mental illness and have them be recognized in the room as a caregiver and, and work together? And so we recognized how important it was to engage the caregiver early and Amy has done a, a lot of that work. Um, at the same time, we wanted to think about how we could partner with oncology. Here we have two highly specialized needs at the same time. If we imagine having someone with schizophrenia and a new diagnosis of colorectal cancer, those are both serious, they both need expertise, um, and it's often helpful to come together to create a plan. And so the, the model is that the oncologist and psychiatrist are together doing a joint visit, uh, potentially with social work or navigation, and that they together understand what the person's needs and understanding of their illness are, what their values, what they hope for, what they fear, they partner with the caregiver, they make a tailored plan that has the best chance to decrease barriers to cancer care. And then we also partner with social work and navigation 
to provide evidence-based interventions that can you know, support mental health, but also to do practical stuff that's super important, like address any practical barriers to cancer care, um, whether those be related to social determinants, transportation, challenges with um, child care, mental health symptoms. I mean, I mean, the list is, is extensive. So, <laughs> uh, you know, all the stuff that you really need to be able to go to treatment and stay there and, and you know, also be okay at the end of it. And that's really the idea. And what we hope to understand in doing a 12-week intervention that's now become 24 weeks is whether would there be a difference? Would it make an impact on um, whether or not people with mental illness were able to get the cancer care that they needed? And so stay tuned. We've enrolled, I think, 52 um, people. So about a third of the way. 53. Um, almost, almost halfway to, yeah. to the, our goal enrollment at a randomized trial. Okay. Oh, um, so these are two people <laughs> who are participating in our clinical research program right now. I don't know what happened. If, um, so, and they, they actually shared this photo um, and wanted you to see it. So Howard um, is a gentleman who's experienced a lot of loss in his life, but one of the things that he remembers, that he and his sister remember, is that they used to dance together, and that you know they call each other boo, and they really love to dance. And I had I had never really known this part of the story because I had only seen seen Howard separately. Um, he had been living in a, a group home um, for a long time, um, where he's being cared for, and he has treatment resistant schizophrenia, so pretty un pretty significant symptoms. Um, he was independent in that he was able to um, manage his own meals. And honestly, the thing that he said, he'd always say to me, Doc, I'm, I'm good. I want my bacon. <laughs> and my food, I'm good. And that was a lot of the conversations that we had um, in, in the limited interactions I had with him. And I, I learned more about him when there was concern raised that he had not been receiving um, the cancer care that he needed at another hospital. And so he was referred to our clinical trial. Um, and we were able to talk with his guardian, enroll him in the trial. And he has received the care for his gastric cancer that, that he needed. It actually would have had potential for cure. At the same time, he had gotten sicker um, and you know, had not been able to stay at his group home. And so we've been partnering with the nursing home where he's staying. Um, and you can see that um, it's the oncologist saying that, you know, it, it was possible for him to get standard of care. And that it's just so helpful to work together to coordinate care and, and build trust. And, you know, I think that one of the most um, like practical things is I've been kind of trying to think about how we can kind of continue to do that when I can't go see him in person is FaceTiming with our navigator at the same time he has much better banter with her. So that's been just like the kind of creative problem solving that we do. So yeah, we need those bridges. Um, you know, and I think that in terms of what you guys have all said you want to learn today, these are some of the key themes that, that come in. And I was just happy, and I think Amy too, to see that equity was at the center, that we are really here to bridge this equity gap, in addition to all the other key things that are here um, that really bring together oncology, mental health, policy, together to do what people need. Is there what the, the work groups that we convened last week were focused on? Amazing to see 20 to 30 people in each work group talking about key advocacy issues, what it means to be a caregiver, the importance of compassion satisfaction, 25 researchers thinking about collaboration at different phases in their careers, a lot of wonderful ideas coming up, it's really digital interventions, but just also just good ideas, and then just a lot of conversations about what would be best practices at the time of diagnosis of cancer and mental health. 